All right. Uh, well, great. Thank you so much um, uh, for your kind introduction. And I wanted to start by thanking the company of biologists to giving me this opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I, uh, I today I'm going to share a story with you um, that I've been working with uh, veiled chameleons and um, trying to understand how they establish uh, left-right patterning as they develop it. So uh, why do we care about left-right patterning? Don't we look uh, pretty symmetrical? Well, uh, turns out we're actually uh, pretty asymmetrical and um, the, oops, excuse me. Let's see, there we go. And um, so specifically our internal organs are quite asymmetrical. We have a different number of lung lobes on different sides. Our heart is on the left side. The stomach is on the left side. The liver is on the right. And it's really important that the organs are positioned um, that way in relation to each other at least. So you may have heard of people who have complete organ reversal, um, but they lead perfectly normal lives and sometimes don't even know they have the condition. That's because the organs are positioned correctly in relation to each other. And there's even uh, celebrities who have this condition. The problems arise somewhere in between, where at some point in development, the organs kind of hesitate which side is left and which side is right. And these conditions are known as heterotaxy, and they can be highly lethal in the first year of life. So what I'm really interested in is understanding um, how do we establish this left-right asymmetry? So the organ that is responsible for establishing left-right asymmetry um, uh, is known as the left-right organizer. Oftentimes it's also referred to it as the node. I'll, I'll use the terms interchangeably. So in the human, the node is right here. It's this dot that is in the posterior end of the embryo, just anterior to the primitive streak. So here it is in the actual embryo. In the mouse, the node has a teardrop shape. Here it is in the side view of the embryo. And here's the Hansen's node in the chicken. And I'm just going to pause for a second and tell you that this is how you're going to see embryos in this talk. So we're going to look at the ventral view the, of the embryo, so their belly, and the embryo's left is going to be on your right, and the embryo's right is going to be on your left, just to make things a little confusing. So there's actually an interesting difference between uh, the left-right organizers on, uh, on the one side of my slide and the other. So mice and humans actually have motile cilia in their left-right organizer that at some point in development create this leftward flow. And as a result of flow of this leftward flow, we then have asymmetric expression of genes like nodal on the left and the right sides of the embryo. Chickens, on the other hand, accomplish some of the similar, uh, similar things in a different way. And they don't have motile cilia in their left-right organizer, but in cell, they use uh, cellular movements. It turns out that having motile cilia in the, your left-right organizer is the ancestral state. So mice and humans have motile cilia in their nodes, but so do frogs, zebrafish, and sea urchins. Now I told you that chickens instead use cellular rearrangements. So for a long time, we actually had no idea what happens in other left reptiles like lizards and snakes, and whether this loss of motile cilia in the left-right organizer was something that only occurred in uh, birds, or was that something that was common to all reptiles? Now, it turns out that we actually know um, very little about reptile development in general. We, we don't know whether they have motile cilia in their left-right organizer. We know very little about their gastrulation, neural crest cell migration, pretty much any of the topics in early development. Why is that? It turns out that when uh, squamates, lizards, and snakes lay their eggs, the embryo is actually pretty far advanced in its development already. They already have a head, uh, the somites are formed, they have a beating heart, often they will have limbs already. So we're far too late to study neural crest cell migration, gastrulation, and things like that. That's why we're so very excited about uh, veiled chameleon embryos, because at the time veiled chameleons lay the eggs, the embryo is just a ball of cell. We think it's just at pre-gastrulation stages of development, which means we finally have a reptile model to study all of those early processes. We also think that uh, veiled chameleon early veiled chameleon embryos were remarkably similar to human embryos. We think we can recognize uh, the amnion in both, uh, the epiblast, which would give rise to the embryo, and then the hypoblast over here on the ventral side. So we're hoping that one day veiled chameleons will be a really nice model for these um, the early development uh, studies of human embryogenesis. So I think um, overall veiled chameleons are just uh, great to be a research organism. So I told you that the embryos at pregastulation of uh, at the time of uh, egg laying, but they're also a popular pets. So there's already established husbandry and they lay eggs year round and they produce pretty large clutches of eggs, which means I have access to embryos at all the different stages um, at all any time of the year. 
I've also developed a number of uh, tools over the years. Um, some of the things I want to highlight, I've I've done a um, a, st a staging poster of embryonic development uh, from the time of laying to hatching. Uh, I can do cell culture, embryo culture, and live imaging. Uh, and we've recently uh, sequenced and annotated the genome, and we have the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, project for um, oh, for uh, gene editing currently in progress. So now I have um I have this perfect uh, perfect system. I have a lot of the tools necessary for me. Uh, so I'm really excited about to start uh, really addressing topics about uh, that I care about, like left right patterning. So I'm going to start by describing uh, what happens in in a in a just kind of generic model organism, for example, a mouse. So you're going to have your uh, node, which is going to have cilia and asymmetric uh, flow. That somehow that flow induces the expression of nodal on the left side. Nodal is able to auto-activate itself, and then it also induces expression of things like PIDXQ, a transcription factor that effectively signals to the organs that they are on the left side. Nodal will also induce the expression of its own repressors, like Lecti over here. So there's an inactivator exhibitor loop making sure that nodal doesn't go completely out of control on the left side here. But also it will induce expression of Lecti over here in the midline. And this is known as the midline barrier that prevents nodal from crossing over to the right side and inducing its expression there. So hopefully you can tell that nodal is a pretty important molecule in the system. So that's where we wanted to start um, our exploration in chameleons. Now, when I started this work, I knew that mice have a nodal gene that's asymmetrically expressed, and so do chickens. What I didn't realize is that they're actually different nodal genes. So it turns out that there was a um, there was a duplication event in John vertebrates. So most fishes fishes actually have two nodal genes. Um, however, ma mammals have no lost one of them and retained what I'm going to call nodal one. Uh, whereas birds have lost a different one and have retained what I've, um, I'm going to call as nodal two. Now, so we knew that there was a potential for two nodal genes. And uh, once we sequenced and assembled our genome, we were able to look for them in our genome. And turns out that chameleons actually have uh, both nodal one and nodal two present in their genomes um, in kind of expected locations in the genome. Now, all right, so that's exciting. We have these genes, but there are they actually involved in um, left-right patterning? So it was time to really set up this molecular cascade for, for chameleons as well. So I told you we have uh, two nodal genes, and based on their expression patterns, we believe they're both involved in left-right patterning because both of them are expressed nicely on the left side of the embryo. Now, as far as nodal repressor, repression, um, we do see that left T is expressed very nicely in the midline, suggesting that it has retained its midline barrier function, but we never see expression of left T in the lateral plate mesoderm. And instead, we think that Cerberus 1 has kind of taken over that function of the repressor of nodal signaling in the lateral plate mesoderm. And then, uh, of course, we see PIDX2 expressed nicely on the left side, where it signals to organs that they are on the left side of the embryo. So, so I've just walked you through this entire cascade of nodal signaling, but I started this talk with, uh, with kind of this initial step of what happens in this left-right organizer. And so far, I haven't told you anything about what happens in chameleons. So as I mentioned, there's kind of two main ways we know right now to break uh, symmetry is to have motile cilia and this asymmetric flow in the left-right organizer, um, or to have these asymmetrical cellular movements. So looking for motile cilia was kind of the first easy way to, to go about um, figuring out what's in, happening in chameleons. So in order to look for cilia, I looked, I did a staining for um, for the two genes, FOXJ1 and DNA H11. They're both absolutely required to make motile cilia. And these are the stages when left-right patterning is occurring. And hopefully you can see we don't really see expression on either one of these genes at this stages. And that's this tells us there, there are really no motile cilia present in the embryo at the time of left-right patterning. So motile cilia cannot be involved in this process. All right, so if it's not motile cilia, can we look for these asymmetrical cell movements? And there's kind of a couple things to look for. So in the chicken, as the, the, as the cells uh, move over to the left side, they will literally drag signal over like sonic hedgehog over here. And also the, uh, the, uh, the morphology of the Hansen's node is also changing in the process. So we had a couple things to we were able to look out for. So we decided to look by um, live imaging first. I developed a way to culture these embryos and do live imaging with them long-term. 
Uh, so I imaged from the ventral side of the embryo, but what I'm going to show you right now is going to be actually an optical cross-section through this posterior end of the embryo near the blastopore. So over here, we have the left side here, the right side is over here, and then the dorsal side is going to be on top. So as this movie plays, if I can get it to play, there we go. Uh, hopefully what you're going to see is that the left side is going to move dorsally as, as we get this trigger for establishing left-right asymmetry. And then the right side is just going to catch up with it. And the embryo is going to start looking pretty symmetrical once again. And that's that. So basically an embryo does this dorsal wiggle where it moves left side and then right side. And then at that point, the molecularly left-right patterning is established. Now, so far, we just looked at a couple cells sort of moving. Um, can we tie this process to some sort of molecular markers? So that's where Sonic Hedgehog once again came into play. We we're wondering, can we see any of these asymmetrical movements using Sonic Hedgehog? So when I start, I started this um, this project. I actually these were uh, some of the earliest stages, some of the first stages I looked at. And you know, Sonic Hedgehog was like, okay, it looks perfectly symmetrical. Nothing is interesting there. However, um, it was really when I looked at some of the earlier stages in development, then it becomes kind of hard to miss that Sonic Hedgehog actually does highlight highlight a very remarkable asymmetry over here near the blastopore. Now, what's interesting is that Sonny Hedgehog itself is actually uh, symmetrically expressed. It's expressed equally on the both left and right sides of the floor plate. And instead, what we're seeing is that there is actually a, a symmetry in the uh, this um, neural plate uh, hinge, mid median hinge point that is actually tilted to the left of the embryo. And what's happening is, is a Sonny Hedgehog is just kind of highlighting this asymmetry in the tissue for us. What's also very cool to see is that, you know, I told you that nodal is asymmetrically expressed, but that's actually happening at later stages. At the stage when we're first starting to see this asymmetry highlighted by Sonny Hedgehog, there's actually no nodal expression. So what we think is happening that there is these morphological, uh, move, uh, morphological asymmetry in the tissue that's happening that then somehow triggers this more uh, molecular asymmetry and we get asymmetric expression of nodal. All right, so this was kind of a lot of information that just dumped on you all at once. So there's really two takeaway, takeaway points in this presentation. I want you to remember that motile cilia are not involved in left-right patterning in veiled chameleons, and instead, asymmetries established through changes in tissue morphology that then trigger the, uh, these molecular changes. So, um, so this was sort of just a one small project that I wanted to describe to you using chameleons, but I think they're a fantastic model to study early development in reptiles and amniotes in general. So as far as early development, I'll use the embryos to continue answering questions about left-right patterning. You know, I'm eager to find out, well, why is this mechanism so different from in reptiles from, say, mice or zebrafish, for example? But also there's many, many uh, questions we can also be answering. So chameleons have some very, very cool evolutionary novelties. Um, uh, one of the things I would like to look at is their limb formation. So their limbs... Um, are actually have this very split phenotype and the split goes all the way down through their wrist. And these limbs are perfectly adapted for grabbing onto uh, branches. Now, what's interesting is that there's a human condition that has exactly the same phenotype. So what? So the question is, what can we learn from these adaptations in chameleons about defects in humans? I've said that we've also sequenced the genome, so it's very interesting to look at the evolutionary aspects in the genome. Uh, we've uh, One of the things I'm eager to look at is the uh, sex determination gene. We've determined that um, chame veiled chameleons follow the XY mode of sex determination. I narrowed down the region um, to, uh, to, to a small genetic region, and so far there is no known sex determination genes in the region, which means that there is a novel sex determination gene that's present in chameleons, which also opens doors for even broader questions. Well, how do genes uh, evolve new functions to begin with? So I think these um, these animals provide a very fertile ground for a lot, a lot of really cool um, uh, questions in, um, in developmental biology. So in the end, I want to thank members of the Trainer Lab for letting me uh, work on this really uh, with this really cool uh, model organism on some wacky questions. Uh, people without whom this work really wouldn't be able to uh, happen. Uh, the folks in our reptiles and aquatics facility who take care of our animals, uh, my funding sources. Uh, once again, the company of biologists for um, to give me the opportunity to speak to you here today. And if I have time, I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Let's see. Okay, we've already got questions uh, from Catherine Brown. Do you have any insights into what induces the initial morphological asymmetry? I have no idea. Uh, that's one of the questions we'd left. I would love to figure out. Uh, so, so in so the only time we've all we've ever looked at these morphological asymmetries, people have looked in chicken. There's the famous Polonaise movements. So the the movements that establish left right asymmetry in chicken is part of the Polonaise movements. And um, one of the ideas is that it actually kind of goes down to more molecular level. So our molecules, for example, actins, right? There's the um, the L and R, right? There's 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 inherent asymmetry to molecules, and the idea is is that perhaps you know during actin polymerization, it sort of naturally pushes you know the polymerization off to one side, and then that kind of induces the cell migration. So that's sort of one idea, perhaps something somewhat similar that can be happening here. But I think nobody has really truly tried to kind of go for, to try to try what what we see in cell culture in these um, cells to kind of a bigger organism. I think we could we potentially have a really cool model to to try to see if that's that's the case or if it's something else. But I have no idea what really triggers it. Yeah. Uh, a question, a chicken or egg question. Did reptiles lose cilia, cilia in the organized and adapt alternatives or did morphological movements replace the need for cilia? That's a great question. Um, so I I think um, I think that uh, that I think that this is something that perhaps was a more ancestral, and then uh, once once these the once the cilia appeared in the left right organizer, they have really started. Um, uh, I mean, this is I have no true yeah, no, support for this, but I think cilia kind of appeared, and then we got really excited. And I wonder if we've looked really hard in other organisms if we could find some of these asymmetrical movements. Because what I didn't tell you is that reptiles don't have cilia in their left right organizer, but there's one other group of animals that don't do don't have them. So even toad ungulates. So think pigs, cows, hippos, mm. whales, right? All of those animals, we think, so based on genomic data and some gene mm. loss, we think those guys also don't have motile cilia. And as far as we can tell from morphology of the nodes in pigs, um, it seems there's probably also some of these morphological changes huh. that are happening. So, so either the two groups kind of independently, independently lost cilia and involved somewhat similar methods, or perhaps something was there originally and it just sort of reappeared if you, if you, if you wish yeah, for us to see. Mm. Fascinating. Uh, nice talk. Do you think this new organizer is conserved across reptiles or how about beyond reptiles? You kind of addressed that a bit, but. It's a little bit, yeah. So, um, so it gets a little bit trickier. Um, I mean, because obviously all the different species are different. Um, the chameleons, uh, the most reptiles other than avians, don't have um don't have a primitive streak, right? So things get a little bit different there as far as gastrulation. But as I said, yes. So, uh, so this is something that we see is in all reptiles, as far as we know. People have now looked. So we've looked in chameleons, but people have also looked in turtles. Um, and we know what that's happening in avians. So we've sort of covered most of the reptiles there, at least one species uh, for most branches. And then, as I said, it's also happening in, um, in even toad ungulates. And that's sort of what we know so far. Um, so there is some... Uh, there is some similarity between methods. I don't know whether it's truly conserved between reptiles and even toad ungulates. Yeah. What about anolis? Has anyone looked in anolis? Uh, so, so... I'm just no trying to think of the ones that people have colonies for and stuff yeah oh uh, yeah so the short answer is no uh we have um we have uh i've di we've dissected some embryos but um as i said the by the time anoles uh, lay their eggs uh... the embryos are too late so we have um for a side projects we were dissecting some um some moms and i basically got all of the the uh, you know earlier stages right. um and so we we think it's there but it's something similar but um um, you know, yeah. you have to look deeper, but I'm fairly certain it will be the same. Yeah. People have looked in geckos and it's the same in geckos. Okay. Too. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think that's our questions okay. for now. Again, keep an eye on the Q and A just in case mm -hmm. something pops up. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you so talk. much. Yes.